the first thing I'm going to say is this is by far the largest room I've ever presented in, so I'm right now scared out of my wets. <laughs> So please, like, make huge jazz hands if I get way too animated and start talking way, way too fast. Because I did that at DrupalCon Bogota, and I still have not forgiven myself for that. So just let me know to slow down. <laughs> All right. So why don't we get started? Um, just in case you didn't know which room we are in, this is for Capture the Drupal 8 Flag. First thing you might be wondering is, who is this weird person in front of you with the weird red hair? And, uh, yeah, you might be wondering, yeah, I actually do say that, especially at 3 a.m. when the flag tests do actually pass. My name is Tess Flynn, otherwise known as Socket Wench. That's Wench, not Wrench. I'm the module co-maintainer for Flag, for Flag Friend, and for Examples, and I am a Drupal developer with FFW. There's a lot of different names for what FFW is supposed to stand for. The one I'm, I'm most fond of is fruit-flavored wombats. Who wants a t-shirt? T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I got one more. Anyone want another one? I think you raise your hand first. I've also got some flag stickers up here, just a limited amount, because I gave so many away already. And I've got two sunglasses, uh, pairs of sunglasses. So. I'll be giving those out too. Just in case you didn't know, we are hiring. And you can either talk to me or you can talk to the people at the booth if the booth is still there because this is the last session of the con. So you might be wondering, why the heck did I port flag module to Drupal 8? Well, let's set the way back machine all the way to 2013. And I was in a room very much like this room at DrupalCon Portland. And I was listening to Angela Webchick Byron talk about the pants module. And she was up there begging people, please, we need someone to port modules now because all we've done so far is core. We don't know if any of this will actually work in a module yet. And I thought, well, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I can completely understand where you're coming from, but yeah, that's someone else's job. And the thing is, because my natural first question was, why shouldn't I just contribute to Drupal 8 directly? I mean, that sounds like the best thing to do, right? Why waste my time on a module when I should be working on Drupal 8? Well, there's a few problems I was facing. The first problem I would like to call is the reverse Sisyphus problem. Now, if you remember the myth, Sisyphus is a man that was doomed by the gods to push a boulder up a hill every day of his life. And by the time he nearly got to the top of the hill and was almost finished, it would start rolling all the way back down and he'd have to start all over again. Now the problem is, the reverse Sisyphus problem is that the boulder is already running down the hill and, and I have to go and chase after it and hope that maybe, maybe I can catch up to it and impart some small sense of momentum in it before it gets away from me again. I only had a few hours a night to work on this and every night I'd have to learn a whole bunch of stuff just to start contributing to Drupal 8. I had to learn about Symfony had to learn how PHP object-oriented programming works. I had to do all this stuff. And it was like, by the time I catch up at the end of a night, because I pit, uh, start every night picking an issue, study, by the time I was done, my three hours per night were up, I had to go to bed. Next day, I get back to it, and someone already posted a patch. I was stuck in what I call the Valley of Dearth. Now, when you're a beginner, you're up on Beginner's Hill. And there's lots of stuff that you can do. There's issue summaries, running tests. You could reroll patches. But everybody really wants to be in Dev City, to work on to actually write those patches, work on real issues, really push core forward. The problem is, between Beginner's Hill and Dev City, there's a big valley. And in that valley of dearth, there might be some stuff you might work on. You've already, you're already bored with all of the easy stuff you can do, and it doesn't feel like you should be the one doing it because you're experienced at it. You can turn it over in a few minutes. A novice should be doing this now, not you. You want to do want something more impressive, more interesting. But there's not much between Dev City and Beginner's Hill. And I was really starting to bug me. I was starting to get really depressed. And I was sitting there one morning, like any morning, 
uh, a good idea came to me while in the shower. And it occurred to me, you know, given all this, why don't you just do something else? Why don't you just completely change your strategy? There's got to be a different way. And I thought, well, I'm already a flag module maintainer. Why don't I just port flag module? So who in this room knows what flag module is? Show of hands. OK, let me ask the opposite question. Who doesn't know what flag module is? OK, this section is for you guys. And you know what? One of you, one of you should get a t-shirt or two shirts. You, and if someone could hand that way back to the gentleman, way all the way back here. There we go. <laughs> this is, I'm amazed that my wrist is still holding up because I injured it in a cycling accident about three weeks ago. So the flag module, you'll hear this is a picture of a rendered node on Drupal 8. It looks like any other node, but there's these two little weird links at the bottom. Those are flag links. Now, what does this allow us to do? Well, let's abstract this a bit. Here we have a node, happy little node, and we have a user that comes along and goes, oh, shiny, and they go and stick a flag in it. The uh, module that makes the poink sound has yet to be developed. <laughs> we have a patch that will take it. Other users come along and add their own flags. Now from this, we can actually come up with a definition of what flag module actually does. It enables administrators to define Boolean fields that may be attached to site content, which each user, each user may set or unset. It's different than a checkbox because a checkbox only gets set once, and usually only the node creator or editor can do that. This is for every user. It works kind of like this. There are three principal objects involved. There's the flag, there is the thing that gets created to identify what the flag, if it was flagged or not, called the flagging. And then there's the thing that we're flagging, which my English teacher has never forgiven me for, the flaggable. And it works kind of like this. You can define the flag administratively, and it lives as long as it's been defined. Flaggings can be, uh, be defined for the flaggable entity, and once a flaggable, enti a flaggable has been, a flagging has been created for the flaggable entity, it shows as flagged until they either unflag it or the, flagging gets, the flag gets deleted. I'm waiting for one person to finish their picture. <laughs> There we go. So flags are the administrator defined Boolean field. It's stored as an entity since Drupal 7, um, since the module version 7x, 2x, it may be attached to only one entity type, but multiple bundles of the same type. So you can define a node flag, and it can be defined to one or more bundles, one or more content types, or you define a user flag, or you define a comment flag in Drupal 7, Drupal 8 it's different, or you, de or you de define a uh, Oh, geez, there's a whole bunch of other kind of entity types that you could flag. <laughs> They're all created under admin structure flags and may be fielded as of Drupal 7, uh, version 3x. Now, flaggings are the entity created in response to when a user sets a flag. It basically has four in pieces of information in it. Which flag was set, on what entity the flag was set, when was the flag set, and who set the flag. Flaggables are the entity that has a flag defined for it and for which flaggings may be created. Okay, we know what flag module does now. So let's sit down and we're ready to go. We we're said, okay, we're all fired up. We're gonna port this module to Drupal 8. It's gonna be awesome. There's gonna be objects and there's gonna be plugins and there's gonna be all this cool stuff and I'm ready to code in. That's the last thing you should do. First thing you should do is a code review. Ask yourself, how does your module really, really work? One of the core pieces of flag module that I found is that we have something called handler classes in the Drupal 7 version. And they do a whole bunch of different stuff. But usually, they relate the flag to the type of entity that it actually applies to. Mostly, the module is a pretty standard Drupal 7 module. There's a large surface area of straight functions. Entity for support was refactored in. 
object-oriented programming was actually used. But, well, you know, it's a bit like the blob. PHP 4 classes are just kind of weird today. In Flag, there was a whole bunch of weird factory methods to make objects, because there were no constructors in PHP 4. And all of the object-oriented design in Flag 7 came from PHP 4, not 5. So we have all these weird factory methods. All the methods were public, too. We had no access control on the individual methods. All variables were public. And basically what we got is a big blob of functions for every flag handler class. It was a mess. So now that we've reviewed our code, we need to pick where we need to start. The first thing you have after that, once you've done your code review, you really want to sit down and look at it with new eyes. Figure out what you really want to do. Ta create a new vision for your module. You want to question all the things. Ask yourself, does the module really have to work this way? We had to allow for assumption X before. Do we still have to allow for it? Can we do this better? Can we do this simpler? You might also want to actually go and ask your users, how do they actually use your module? Because you may have an idea on how your module is supposed to work, but your users might have a very different idea indeed. Come at it with new eyes. Get up at 3 a.m. if you have to. Go on a vacation, get away from code for a week, and then look at it again. Anything to put you in a fresh mindset to look at your code from a completely new perspective. And then qu start questioning everything. Then you want to set some expectations. Usually with the Drupal 8 module, there's kind of two uh, uh, different perspectives you want to work at this. There's the people who want to just get work done, and then there's the people who just want to learn. Now, if you're someone who wants to sit down and learn Drupal 8, and you don't care how long the porting process takes, how many blind alleys you go down, how many times you have to start all over again, start now. Don't wait. Start now. Go, go ahead. Open your laptop. Start coding. I'll wait. If you're the kind of person who wants to w just get work done, you're not that interested, you just want to get the module ported and move on with your life, then you probably want to wait. Now, if you're in the middle, you might want to keep it experimental. Open a branch or a new repository or a local folder of your code and just start playing around. See what comes to your mind. See what ideas you might want to explore. Most people are going to be in that keep it experimental stage. You might have also thought, okay, well, if I'm going to start my module, I'm going to port my tests. That's not a terrible idea. Test-driven development has a lot of merits going for it. But the thing is, it's a double-edged sword. Simple test is available in Drupal 8. So you can largely write the same tests in Drupal 8 that you did in Drupal 7. It's not the preferred way. It's probably going to go away in Drupal 9. But you can still do it now. The only problem is that porting your tests means that you'll probably be limiting your thinking. Because with those tests come all the old assumptions of your module, and you're no longer questioning everything. After that, identify the most central piece of your module and then work your way out. Now for flag module, that was the flag entity. So first we wanted to redesign the flag class with PHP 5 and modern object-oriented programming. So what we did is we had created a flag class, but we also created a flag interface. Now, an interface is kind of like a contract for your object. It says, this thing will do this stuff. It's not the actual work, but it says that this is the promise that we'll have. These are the things that it will get done. We also derive from a Drupal-provided class called config entity bundle base, and that does all of the Drupal work for us. We break this down. This is what the flag interface looks like. It's a bit bigger now than it is, but these are the core methods. The interface is that contract. It tells you what the module is supposed to do, the things it does. It does not contain any state or any method bodies. It just contains the method names and signatures. This is also a wonderful place to document your code because you can keep all your documentation in the interface class. And the interface class then is a lot easier to read. And then when you actually have your real code, all you have to do is use an inherit doc in each method and you no longer have to have a huge doc block in your class. 
Drupal has so Drupal 8 has two different kinds of entities. In Drupal 7, we only had one. An entity was an entity was an entity was an entity. In Drupal 8, we have two different kinds. We have configuration entities and we have content entities. Now, a configuration entity is, desi is de designed for administrator-defined structures. It may be exported to YAML. It lives in the database, but it may be exported to YAML at any time and therefore moved from site to site to site. And basically, it's structure, not data. For our config entity, we actually derive from, this is supposed to be config entity bundle base. The code is right. The ti slide title is wrong. It's the foundation class for configuration entities. So, oh, this does all the Drupal work for us. So all of the extra stuff that makes an entity an entity is in that class. We don't have to copy it. We don't have to work with it. It's just there. All we have to do is extend from it. And then it does all of the Drupal work. In order to define the fields that belong on the configuration entity, we need to create a config entity schema. Now the schema basically, basically is a key value system that uh, contains the data type of each field and what fields that it, Drupal needs to save from the class. This is a portion of flag schema. It's stored in the module root slash config slash schema. And you can see it's just a series of na uh, name values with types and labels. This is just a sample. There's a lot more in that class. Ideally, we want to create a class variable for every field we define in the config entity schema. This gives us a few different advantages. It gives us code completion in our integrated development environment, and it's also the easiest place to document the schema. Don't document it in the YAML file. It's a mess. It doesn't work very well. Document it in the entity class. It feels much more natural. It will belong there. This gets to another point. Please, please use an IDE and a debugger. Yes, really, it's time. In Drupal 7, we had about 3,000 files, of which you needed maybe a dozen of them in order to actually understand how Drupal was really working, how to, to write modules with it. And those files tended to be very big. In Drupal 8, there are at least five times that many files, and each one of those is much smaller. Using a basic text editor can be done, but you either have to have an amazing memory or you have to search Google a lot. An integrated development environment will actually save you a lot of time and a lot of hair pulling. It will be frustrating if you're a plain text file editor at first. Then in a few weeks, once you get used to it, you'll wonder why you haven't done this sooner. I like PHP Storm, but there's also NetBeans and a whole bunch of other ones that you can choose from. Also create a getter and setter for all your schema variables. Your interface isn't complete until you have a getter and setter for every schema variable. Also, never mark any schema class variables as private because Drupal won't be able to access them. And the reason why is that within the base config entity class, there is actually a get and a set method which will be able to access all the class variables. Now, if your, your schema variables are protected, those methods will work without a problem. If your schema variables are private in your entity class, Drupal won't be able to do anything and your entity will be blank every time it tries to save. All right, we have our flag entity class defined. Let's plug that into Drupal. So we have our class, we're gonna hand it over to a, on a golden platter to Drupal and then we're ready to go. It's like, I have brought you this. And then Drupal's like, what the? What am I supposed to do with that? That's just a class. I, I don't know what you're, I've got lots of those. Why do I need another one? And of course the flag class is sitting there sad and lonely. The problem is that we need another piece of information. We need something to tell Drupal what this class actually does. We need kind of like a, like a, a config entity assembly manual for flag. When we hand the assembly manual and the class to Drupal, Drupal goes, oh, I get it now, and it goes off and builds stuff. That assembly manual is called an annotation. It's metadata contained within the class doc block. 
so that Drupal knows what this class is supposed to do. Now it kind of looks like this. It tells Drupal what the following class is, why it's important, and where to find the other important pieces of functionality. This is what flags annotation looks, at, uh, looks like, or at least part of it. And you'll notice there's a lot of different stuff in here. There's an entity type, there's a whole bunch of ID and label stuff, some handlers, some links. Let's break this down. What is all this weird stuff? The first thing is that we have this at config entity type at the top. This is the annotation type. It tells Drupal what follows is a configuration entity. It's used for feature discovery after a, class, a cache clear. So this actually prevents Drupal from having to execute all of those five times as many files. It treats them as a text file and reads the annotation first, and then it knows what to actually execute in PHP. The next thing is the handler sequence. The handler sequence tells Drupal where to find other related pieces of functionality, like the list of all of these entities page or other key forms to create, edit, and delete this entity type. All right, so we have plugged our entity into Drupal. Now let's build the administrative interface. It looks like this. This is, the this is the list all entities page for flag. It's very rudimentary. It's just a series of rows one add flag button, and some operations, and some extra text at the bottom. How we made this is we, cre we derived from a, cl we created a class called flag list controller. It derives from a Drupal provided class called config entity list builder, and provides the admin structure flags page. It only has two important methods. It has build header and build row. Build header defines the number of the kinds of columns that are in the list table. And each row actually lets you populate the content of each, of each row in that table. We don't even have to load the entity. Drupal gives that to us for free. Now that we have the list page, we need to uh, do the add and edit flag pages. Now, the way that our add and edit flag page works is they're kind of similar. They're mostly the same other than a few special details. So we have a number of form classes. We actually have four form classes. We have flag form base, flag add form, flag edit form, and flag delete form. Now let's ignore flag delete form for the moment, and let's look at flag, uh, flag add and flag edit. Both of those derive from a base class called flag form base, and those derive from a Drupal provided class called entity form. Flag form base does all the real form stuff. It builds the form, it handles the validation, it handles the submit. So why do I have these two other classes then? Well, both of these handle those different details that make one form different from the other when adding versus editing the flag. It basically ch uh, determines where the default values come from, either statically or from the existing entity, or, or and also changes the text of the flag submit button. That's it, that's all that's in there. This is actually a very common pattern for creating forms in Drupal 8. You'll see this a lot. You'll have a flag form, you'll have a form base, and then an add form, and then an edit form. And we also have a flag delete form. Now the flag delete form looks like this when you actually access it. It has a question, it has some text, and it has either a delete button or a cancel link. Now that derives from a class, uh, that, that actually comes from flag delete form, and flag delete form derives from a class called entity confirm form base. Now entity confirm form base is a Drupal provided class that provides us this quick yes or no form. It only has about three methods we need to uh, define. That's it. And then we have that form completed. Okay. We have our admin interface, we have our entity, let's make it routable. So, we have a user, they go to, uh, they go to Drupal 8, and then after that, where we need to match all of this to our form classes somewhere in Drupal. In previous versions, we had hook menu, but we don't have hook menu any, anymore. So how do we tell Drupal where to find a route, a path, and match it to a piece of code to execute? Well, we have a file called flag.routing.yaml. And flag.routing.yaml contains these key pieces of information, a route name and the path. Now we have the annotation as well, 
which tells us uh, when we have the uh, when we have the path, it matches to the route name, and it matches to the annotation and loads the correct form. This gets to another point. Drupal 8 doesn't think in paths; it thinks in route names. So, we wanted to add, you know, that add button to our existing path. How do we do that? You'd think, oh, we'll just add that to the routing file, right? I mean, that works. The problem is that we can't do that because the routing file only is for new paths. You can only define new routes. You can't modify existing ones. For that, we have another file. We have flag.links.menu.yaml. This allows you to add to existing routes. And what this does is this one adds the list page to system admin structure so that we actually, so when we go to uh, the admin structure page, we actually have a link to the flag list. We don't define what flag list is because that's already defined within the routing document. Next, we need to connect that add button. Again, we can't add this to the routing file because we can only define new routes. We need to add to an existing one. So we have another file. We have flag.links.action.yaml, which allows us to attach click actions to existing routes. It has just uh, it's basically a key value store. It has the route name, and it has which page it appears on. So from here, Drupal can assemble all of the stuff necessary to actually link all the pieces of functionality together. The thing is, at this point, you're like, oh, jeez, that's just a lot of code to write. I'm going to be at this forever because it's going to take me months to write all this boilerplate code. And it just starts feeling like I've got a bunch of deep hurting. And I'm not sure if I'll ever get any of this module stuff working again. Well, I'll be in right now, I'm going to show you how to do all of that, build all of that in five minutes. We have lots of scaffolding in Drupal 8. That's actually kind of par for course for any object-oriented system. We have lots of YAML files, interfaces, base classes, base forms. It's all necessary stuff. And in the end, it's actually better practice programming, but it's really tedious to write. So what are we going to do? We're going to reduce our tedium by using Drupal console. Drupal console is another project that will allows us to generate a whole bunch of that scaffolding code with a few clicks and a few keystrokes on a command line. So here we have the generate module. We actually invoke Drupal console, and we call Drupal generate colon module, and then interactively, we specify all the stuff we want. The name of the module, where we're going to put it, the description, the package name, if any, the core version, and a few other things. Once we're done, we can hit enter, and boom, we have the module structure. But that doesn't really do anything yet. OK, that's fine. Let's make a config entity, because that took a long time to make, all the annotations, the base classes, and all of this other stuff. Well, there's also a generate colon entity config command. We specify which module we want to do. It's tab completed, so we don't actually have to type the whole thing in. Then we enter in the class name for uh, the entity we want to create and anything else. And then after that, it makes all this stuff for us. The schema, the routing file, all, uh, the links file, the interface, the entity, and the form stuff. So all of that stuff that we've been talking about, all done in that one command. You can get Drupal Console at drupalconsole.com, or you could go to the Drupal Console page on drupal.org. All right, so we have all of this module done. Now we need to make the flagging entity. We need to complete that picture. Flagging entity starts out very much similarly to the flag entity. We have the flagging class. We derive from another base class called content entity base, and we create an interface, that contract, so we know what the flagging does. Content entity base is best for user-created classes. It lives in the database. You can't export content entities to YAML. They live in the database. The fields are defined not with a schema, but actually by overloading of a method on your entity class called base field definitions. There's no need for hook schema anymore. Drupal will read base field definitions and make the tables for you. 
beyond that, flaggings are really, really weird. They're not created through forms like a node or like a comment. It works like this. You go have a user, they go to the web browser, they go to Drupal, they load a node. Drupal will call flag entity view, hook entity view. And then it's going to attach a flag link to that node. The user might click that link. It goes to some route in Drupal somewhere. And then to something? And then eventually we want to get to entity save so that we can save our new flagging. Now, we could do the something could be a straight function called flag. We had that in Drupal 7, but it's not really a Drupal 8 way of doing things. So what we want to do is we want to do something better. So in Drupal 8, we actually created a new flag service. The flag service is a plain PHP object, but it's registered container-wide in a file called flag.services.yaml. And it allows us to compose other functionality from other modules, as well as other pieces in Drupal, and create our primary storefront for our module. This is where the API lives. It's in flag service. You can create, any, create a basic stru service structure with Drupal console with generate service. Once we have the service, if you ever need to flag anything in Drupal 8, you actually just call the service from the container, so you get the flag service, and then you call the flag or unflag methods, and that's it. All right, we want to make this expandable. We have a working module, but we have a large ecosystem of other modules that we want to have live on in Drupal 8. So we want to make this entire system expandable. Now, we have, the first thing is that we had flag, well, we have the flag entity, and we have all these flaggable entities we want to relate it to. Okay, well, that makes sense. We have a node, a user, and a whole bunch of entities. We'll, we'll just make a subclass for each one of those. I mean, that's fine. We'll have a flag node, a flag user class, and then, oh, right. That doesn't quite work because suddenly there's a whole lot more entities in Drupal 8 than there were in Drupal 7. There's lots of entities. You can practically trip over them in Drupal 8. And we don't want to recreate handler classes. We went down this path before. It's hard to expand. It's not discoverable. And generally, no one has created another flag handler class in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8, we have to do better than that. So what we have instead is instead of creating subclasses, we create a flag, a flag type plugin. And the plugin relates the flag to the flaggable. The flag type pl uh, plugin is discoverable using a custom flag type annotation. You can create your own annotations in Drupal 8, and it's added dynamically to the flag entity. It's not a subclass. Now, because there's a flag type annotation and also a flag ba type base class, if you want to make your own flag type, go right ahead. We have given you all of the pieces just define it in your module, hit cache clear, and it will show up. We have a few different, fla uh, a few different flag type of classes. We have node flag type, user flag type. They both derive from entity flag type, a base flag type base, so you can even do non-entity types if you'd like. And they all derive from a Drupal provided base class called plugin base. So when we have all of this, we have a node flag type and we have a user flag type, but we still have that problem, all those different kinds of entities. Well, we have a special kind of flag type. The entity flag type is called a derivative. It allows us to use data to create the appearance of one entity type plugin for every entity on the site dynamically. So everyone gets their own plugin all the time. We also have to handle the, pro the other problem where we have that some route. Where does that some route come from? Because if we're going to make it so d uh, different for each individual entity type, we want to have that kind of versatility as well. So we want to solve and close that gap. And what we have is another plugin. We have a link type plugin. Now there's actually four link types now. This, is, this screenshot has three. There's an Ajax one, a confirm form link, and a regular normal link. So if you want to expand the flag interface, grab the link type base, create a link type annotation, and then you can do whatever you want. You can make your own link type very, very easily. All right, 
we want to create an API as well. In flag seven, we had hooks. Hooks were everything. We had them to do all this stuff, to define flags, validate and grant access, react to events, provide flag types, provide link types. The thing is, it's a lot of stuff, and in Drupal 8, hooks aren't everything. So instead, it looks a lot more like this. When we define flags, if you have a default flag that your module provides, we actually do that in CMI. So you just have a YAML file that contains your flag. You can even create it using the GUI in your instance of Drupal and then export it and then just copy that into your module file. For providing flag types and link types, we have plugins. We also have events. Now, let's say we have the flag service. We have someone who, you know, we have another thing called an event dispatcher within Drupal. So we have something happens in flag module. We flag something, we unflag something, we delete a flag, we reset a flag. We want to ha ha let everyone know that that happened. Instead of invoking a hook, the flag service actually is going to talk to the event dispatcher. The event dispatcher is a piece of Drupal, another component within Drupal, that a whole bunch of event subscribers have actually listened to. And they say, I want to listen to this flagging event or these flagging events. You can only get the events that you want. And then every time that event happens, flag service creates a flag event class which contains the information that is related to that event and then gives it to the event dispatcher. The event dispatcher then broadcasts it to everyone who's looking for it. There are only four events so far. Actually, there's three events. I'm really trying to get a patch to get the number four in right now. <laughs> Just entity, if something is flagged, unflagged, a flag is deleted, and if a flag is reset. Hooks, hooks still exist in Drupal 8. There's actually another class called the module handler interface. It provides a method called invoke all. That's where module invoke all went off to in Drupal 8. You want to inject that module handler into your service. And it would look kind of like this if you wanted to implement that. In your services constructor, you would inject that and then assign it to a local variable, a class variable. The thing is, in flag service, we assumed that it was going to be a necessity that we'd have to use hooks. And yet, we haven't needed them. We have not even needed hooks yet in Drupal 8 because there are so many different ways that we can do a lot of the things that we did before. We might, though, in the future, still use hooks. There's still a debate about that. All right, we have our module. Let's have a few lessons that I learned while doing this entire porting process over the last two years. First of all, you want to do this in public, but attach a warning label to it. When you actually start your project, the first thing you might want to ask is where should the code live? Should it just live on my particular laptop? That's not really a good idea. You want that module to live somewhere out there so that maybe you can pick up some extra contributors. And if Godzilla decides to attack your house and step on your laptop, then, well, you might you know, not have any backups of your code anymore. Then you'll have to start all over again. There's three different, way, uh, three different places you can usually put it. You can put it on Drupal.org, but is your module really ready to put it on Drupal.org? That's really public. And you might just be starting your project. You might be starting with an empty repository. You don't know if you're going to get to be finished with it or if you'll have to start all over again. Okay, you can put it in a Drupal sandbox, but Drupal sandboxes have limited visibility. They're really hard to find. You'd have to do a lot of public PR yourself. You might also want to put it in a public repository like GitHub or Bitbucket. Maybe you just need a clean break from Drupal to develop your particular Drupal 8 module for a while until you deem it ready to move it back to Drupal.org. In Flag's case, we actually put it on GitHub. That's where the module started. We kept it there for about a year and a half. Another thing is that we had to keep up with core. Keeping up with core over the last two years has been a bit difficult. I can go into a long discussion about how difficult that was and the things that I learned and all the techniques I came up with, but today none of that is really that relevant. What you want to do right now is start with the latest release. Start with that and stick to it. Stick with it until you're ready to actually update. Once you get to a good break in updating your module, then move to the next release that, was, uh, that is out. Avoid developing against Drupal he head unless if you want to lose all of your hair. 
because you will lose all of your hair if you try to keep up with Drupal head. By the time your module is kind of stable, you might want to start testing it against head instead because the changes necessary to, uh, to keep up with head will be far less than the changes to your module that you want to make in order to complete your module. Also ask for help, but be patient. Show a lot of appreciation. There's lots of places to find help. I ha went to Drupal Contribute on IRC. That's where I found the most help. But you can also find a lot of help on the drupal.org list changes page or just the issue queue for Drupal. Sometimes money is your problem. Sometimes you need to ask for funding so you can have travel money to get your team together. You might want to attend a conference. You might want to just take some time off from work just so you can code. In my case, I actually needed to run a crowdfund to go to DrupalCon Austin so that I could get, to get through the last few big hurdles that I was experiencing in the Flag project. And I actually ran that project and it was successful and we had views support by the end of that week. You might want to start wondering, when do you want to move your module back to Drupal.org if you kept it in a sandbox or if you kept it in a third party repository? Now, there's a lot of things that you might want to think about when doing this. Issue queue noise. You might be rapidly developing your module, making a lots of little commits, and you really don't care about the commit messages or making issues about it because it doesn't matter because you already know what you're doing and no one else is working on it. You might have git log pollution where, you ha where all of this stuff is happening. You might ha on the other side of that, you might want to really leverage your community in order to help you work on your module or you really need the visibility so that you can attract developers to your project. Now you might be tempted to do this. The issue queue noise and the git log pollution, that stuff is forever. It's going to take a lot of mental effort and it's gonna live in your repository for a long time. And really, in that case, you'll, be, you'll think that, well, I don't think a lot of people are gonna be working on this because I'm gonna keep this all in my head. And it's not, it doesn't have to be visible because the module's already pretty popular. Don't do that. You wanna do this. One thing that we had during running flag modules, we kept it on GitHub for far too long. It took forever to get it anywhere because it was just me working on it. And in the end, the issue queue noise we, wasn't really a factor. We came up with 70 issues by the time we moved it back to Drupal.org, and all of those were notes saying, please do this later. Also, the git log pollution, that was a bit more of an issue, but in the end, it tur turned out that it was more important to keep all of that history rather than actually throwing it all away and making a big bang squash commit. Leveraging the community and having visibility is far more energy intensive because it takes a lot more time to raise the awareness. You have to go and talk to people, get on podcasts, do all of this stuff and keep screaming and yelling and talking about your new module in order to get the attention necessary to get one contributor to submit one patch. You don't wanna do that, you get it for free on drupal.org in your existing module project. Also things are a lot easier now. We have example module for Drupal 8. We didn't have that when I started. We didn't have Drupal console either. So I had to do a lot of this work myself, reading core code, which is a bit of an effort by itself, just to try to figure out how to make all this stuff. You don't have to suffer the way that I suffered. There's a lot of ways that you could do this now that's a lot easier. One night I sat down with Drupal console, it took me 15 minutes to make 75% of the entire module, and I had to go have a beer after that. All right. Port, if, you, if you're looking at your Drupalite module, you want to port now if you're here to learn. If you're here to work, you'll probably want to wait, but don't wait too long. We're late in the beta stage. That release candidate's gonna happen at any time. We're at 25 criticals the last time I looked at it. And furthermore, we have in flag module not have had a module breaking problem for three months. That's a long time in git commits. So really don't wait too long. Also do a code review. Question everything that your module does. Nothing is sacred. Question everything so you can really reimagine how your module works. Please use an IDE and a debugger. It's gonna save you a lot of time in the end. Patiently ask for help when you can. 
but show appreciation. A lot of the core developers are glad to help, but they're really time constrained, especially after this long development cycle that we're at. Things are actually easier now, especially since Drupal console, than it was then, where we had to ask people directly for every little thing. Do your, uh, make your module in public, but put a warning label on it. Don't have users go ahead and downloading your module if it's gonna break or if it's half done. Put a warning label on it, but don't hide it. Make sure people see it. Is money your problem? Maybe you wanna consider crowdfunding. Also move out of your sandbox quickly. Don't keep it in a third party repository or to drupal.org sandbox for too long. And also things are a lot easier now. All right, I'd like to take a moment to thank all the people who made Flag Module today uh, possible and also for uh, the reason why I'm here today, especially FFW, who I work for, we're hiring, just in case you didn't know, know again. Who wants another shirt? <laughs> I've got like three of these and two, it's like you raised your hand first and then there was you. <laughs> Not so much of an arm. Okay, sure. <laughs> I, again, I do have some flag module stickers up here, two sets of uh, shades. I also have stickers for the Twin Cities Drupal Camp, which is just next month. It was mentioned in the keynotes. We throw a great camp. It's four days long, one day of sessions, one day of free training, two days of sessions, one day of sprints. It's a beautiful, beautiful, sunny Minneapolis. All right, come sprint with us today, tomorrow, right here, learn and contribute about Drupal Core. Mentors will help you set up and find your issues, or maybe you wanna work on flag module with me, maybe, just maybe. <laughs> It'll be right here at the convention center, room 403 AB from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. All right, thanks everyone. You can find the slides on github.io, and you can find me on Twitter. And I don't even know how, how far, how much time we have left. Am I over? <laughs> I think I have like 15 minutes, I think. Anyone have any questions? Question, I think I saw your hand first. See, now my other wrist is tired from ho holding the microphone the entire time. Okay. Um, th thanks, um, great, I enjoy using flag all the time. Um, did you say we're not manually building install files any longer? That schema, that a custom table is. Okay. So we don't really need to defi uh, define hook schema anymore when defining a configuration entity or a content entity. It does that automatically. So it just looks at the either the base de field definitions f uh, method for content entities or it looks at the configuration schema for config entities, and then it will create the tables for you. I think it's really cool. <laughs> and I saw, I saw the, there's a form, you added that, because that was, uh, Wunderkraut had done a module for Drupal 7 for flags to do a form as the flagging. I saw it's in there, right? You put it in the module? Yeah, there's actually a new, um, field entry link type in Drupal 8. It's one of the big features that I actually added in this release cycle because we've had it for so long, but it was only accessible programmatically, so it was kind of a mess. And now we actually just have a link type, so you select it and you can add fields to your flag uh, like any other entity, and it will have all the regular form fields and it will be awesome. Anyone else? Got a question? Uh, what approach did you take for the tests? Did you do it as you went along or did you wait until you kind of had a certain chunk finished and what problems did you come up with? Oh, uh, tests. There's a story about tests. <laughs> so how it kind of went around is that for about nine to 10 months of developing the module, we had no tests in it. It was just me trying to make a flag and then flagging something. And that's because most of the module didn't do any of that stuff. And we weren't sure if B hat was going to be in core or if we should be using PHP, PHP unit or any of those things. In the end, it came down to, it was getting too annoying. So I sat down one weekend and learned how to write simple tests because I hadn't done that before. 
and wrote a whole bunch of simple tasks at that one time, and we're still maintaining them. I'd love to rip them all out and replace them with BHAT tasks, which was my original vision, but that hasn't happened quite yet. Someday I might do that. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. This is really a follow-up on that. So um, I've been I ported my initial module. You know, I got a couple of contrabs, and I've gone through that once, like back in October or something like that. Um, so what's really confusing to me is kind of where testing really is at from that perspective in terms of because there's all the what's available in Drupal 8 versus what's actually on Drupal.org versus, you know, that kind of stuff. So do I hear you saying that BHAT testing is available in Drupal.org or that it <laughs> – okay. It's kind of available. We've laid the groundwork and one of the criticals to actually support broader BHAT testing within Drupal.org and on base core Drupal. But it's not really yet a full BHAT solution where you can just write Gherkin syntax stuff and then turn that over. It's not quite at that point yet, but I'm really hoping that someday it will be because BHAT tests are a lot shorter and easier to maintain. Any other questions? Okay, just as I've got two of them. You're closer, unfortunately. So if I understood right, uh, hooks can be substituted by event subscribers. Okay. The answer is yes, depending on if you're asking Krell or not. <laughs> The other co-maintainers are like, no, you can pull the hooks from my cold, dead hands. And Krell is like, why the heck are you still using that? Events are good. The only problem is that, that events are not as performant as hooks. So if you have a hook that is invoked a lot of times, you might want to keep with a hook because it's still faster than an event. We're working with that to make events as fast as hooks. And then the idea is in Drupal 9, we probably won't have hooks anymore. It will probably be events. And in practice, events are actually better because you only subscribe to the ones you need and you can pass a class with any structured information you need with that so that it can take much more complicated data than a massive array of doom and then a few scalar parameters. So you particularly, you particularly prefer events? So far, I have preferred events because they are more the object-oriented solution, yeah. and we, ha we haven't really had any hooks yet. In fact, I'm trying to get one out of the module right now because flag service doesn't depend on the module handler yet. And this one is kind of old leftover 7x code, and we're trying to replace that with an event. I think that will get in by tomorrow night, but we'll find out. And I know that you had a question. And th fortunately, you're in an empty row, so I can get to you fast. I think you answered uh, most of my question. I think he, he pretty much... I had a similar question, but yeah, I was going to ask you, what was your learning experience on getting away from hooks and how and when did you know not to use hooks? And do you think it's going to change anytime soon that you would want to go back to hooks because they might improve? So to be honest, I'm a mutant because I started, I have tried writing Drupal 5, 6, and 7 modules for years. And the fact is that I never liked them. <laughs> and I came from an academic background where object-oriented programming was a lot more common. So as a result, I'm much more used to objects. And all of the weirdness that Drupal does in order to work made sense in PHP 4. But in PHP 5, it's like, why the heck are we still doing this? And I don't really like hooks. I find them weird, mystical, magic, metachlorian level stuff, and I really don't like them all that much. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that kind of the common complaint we have at work. Everybody hates hooks, and we're like, why are we still doing this? Look, we have much better ways to use. And the other thing is that hooks are really kind of nightmarish for documentation. 
they are horrible, 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 horrible for documentation. Because every time I have to go work on client work in the Drupal 7 world, after working on Drupal 8 during the evening, it's like I can't find anything that works. You mean I have to implement three hooks to get this one thing? Why isn't this an object? Because I would be done already, and it only needs one page on Drupal.org to tell me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Instead, I need three different hooks, and they're in three different page, uh, places, and they're not telling me all the stuff I need to do. It's a mess. Objects are a lot easier to actually document. They're a language level feature to document. So they have language level support. So it's actually a lot easier in the end. Once you get over the intimidation factor and over any knowledge gaps that you might have with object oriented programming. So even if uh, performance is better with hooks, I I, w I particularly pref I would prefer using events. Yeah, this is no, this is what I am catching. That's kind of how I think about it too, because I can define an event on the event class, and I could send one link to someone saying, "Here's the events. After that, use the normal event pattern to subscribe to stuff. You'll be fine." <laughs> and you can do all the stuff you need. It's like, wh what kind of structured data do I need? How many of you in this room have had to go, where in the array of doom do I have to find the stuff I need that's passed to my hook? I hate that. But if it's an object, it's like, oh, I just go find the object, it's got a name, there's the fields, there's the methods. Okay, I'm all good, I'm all good, I'm all good. Give me another coffee. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Again, I still have, I don't have any more t-shirts, but I actually still do have two pairs of uh, shades if you want them. Um, and I also have some flag stickers. There's only a few of them left. Don't, don't go uh, let me go home with them, please. <laughs> I also have a bunch of TC Drupal stickers, so please go ahead and take them. Please take, take. <laughs>